Well, welcome to our services today again by live stream, and we're glad that you could uh, join us as you've already been greeted and welcomed. And uh, again, I say to you, though the building is uh, empty of people, uh, it is full of the Spirit of God. Again, I wish you could uh, join us in this place. And that day's coming when we will gather again in this place. I suspect uh, in the early stages we'll do it a little different than we have in the past, uh, but uh, I look forward to that day when we can regather in this place. I was early this morning reading in the Scripture, and I, I came across a, a verse uh, out of the book of Psalms. It says, O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house. And the place where your glory dwells. And I can tell you that it certainly is that kind of place in here today. I hope you can get a glimpse of uh, and get a sense of the Spirit of God where you are watching or viewing uh, this live stream. We sense it here. And we worshiped uh, in this place. And I hope you've worshiped in your place uh, today. And I want to continue what I began with you uh, last week, talking about the storms, the storms of life. In particular, I want to talk with you about part two of the purpose-driven uh, storm. Now, last week, I talked about the kind of unavoidable storms in life and how God uses them purposefully. They can be natural storms. That is a storm that is a result of just living in a broken world. But God uses even the natural storms, and he wants good to come from those in our life. And then sometimes there are very personal storms, and often uh, they are storms of discipline or storms of correction. God is trying to get our attention about something. It is just possible that the storm that's going on globally right now is a, a possible storm of discipline or a storm to correct and move uh, us back toward God. Uh, and God has created us uh, on purpose. We're, none of us are accidents. We're here on purpose. And that means God has a purpose for our, our life. And because that is true, God also has some purpose-driven storms. And some of those purpose-driven storms are what I call spiritual storms. They're for our spiritual life. And um, uh, they are storms that God sends to specifically develop our spiritual depth. In other words, they're not storms of discipline. They are storms for depth. And uh, God will send them. He designs them for you and for me specifically so he can develop us uh, uh, personally in our relationship with him. Some years ago in the Billingsgate Gazette, they carried a story about uh, some uh, 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 wonderful treasure that was discovered along one of the beaches in Florida. It just so happened that a man named Joel Ruth came across 180 near-mint silver coins. They are what we sometimes refer to as uh, Spanish pieces of eight, and they were in near-mint condition along the beach, worth more than about $40,000. And uh, the coins were actually from a Spanish treasure fleet that had been sunk by a hurricane uh, back in uh, 1715. And now, 300 years later, another hurricane had come through uh, that particular area, and it had it had caused the seashore to be taken back to the same condition it was 300 years ago. And there uh, in the sand were these pieces of eight, these uh, 180 uh, pieces of silver uh, that were discovered. You know, uh, it is a wonderful reminder to us that uh, storms often expose uh, treasures. And uh, oftentimes it takes a storm to uncover some of the 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 hidden treasures that are there in our life. And uh, if we're looking, these storms can become lessons and they can reveal those kinds of treasures in our own life. And in today's passage, Jesus actually sends his disciples into a storm and he does it for the purpose of deepening their relationship with him. Now, it's important before I read the text that I tell you that uh, the context of what's going on. In the uh, verses preceding what we're going to read here in a moment, it is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, really more than 5,000, but uh, because it says uh, men and, and uh, uh, children, or women and children as well, but lots of people. And Jesus had done something amazing there. He had taken uh, just a few fish and a, a few loaves, and he had multiplied those things, and he had fed the entire multitude. And the disciples were amazed at that. But the Bible says as soon as he had finished that, 
that he sent them, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but he sent them on ahead. He put them in a boat, and he sent them on ahead. Now, remember the context. They were coming out of an incredible miracle, unlike probably anything that they had seen, and he puts them in the boat. He sends them out onto the Sea of Galilee. Now, don't confuse this storm with the storm we talked about last week. In that case, uh, Jesus was already in the boat with them on the Sea of Galilee. This is not the same storm. Uh, this is a storm that comes later on. That was an earlier storm. This is another storm. Both of the storms that we've, we are talking about occurred uh, uh, on the Sea of Galilee. But this one has some particular differences to it, some subtle differences, but those differences make all um, the difference in the world. And I hope uh, that today you'll understand how God uses some storms to deepen us spiritually. It is for us. They are purpose-driven. They are tailor-made in some cases for our spiritual improvement. Uh, if you have your copy of God's Word open to Mark chapter uh, 6, follow along with me beginning in verse 45. This is what the Scripture says. Immediately he, that is Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and to go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, which was on the other coast, of course, of uh, the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowd. So he said, you get in the boat, you go on ahead, I'll come later, uh, you get on to the other side, Bethsaida, I'm going to dismiss this crowd, this multitude that he had just fed. Verse 46 says, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on, on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, by the way, if Jesus felt like he needed to go up on a mountain and pray, how much more so do you and I need to say, I need to occasionally get away and pray and seek the Father. And when evening came, verse 47 says, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. Jesus was on the land. They were on the sea, verse 48. And he saw that they were, listen, making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart. It is I do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded for they did not listen they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Pray with me. Father, would you reveal yourself to us today? Would you speak through your word, uh, Father, right into our heart, into our lives, into our situations and our circumstances? God, I pray for those who are viewing this that uh, recognize personal storms that they're in right now for spiritual development. And I pray, God, that you would let us all learn the lessons of the spiritual storms. I pray that the church in America will learn the lesson of the storms, Father, and that we will turn our eyes towards you, and that we'll humble ourselves, and that we'll repent and turn from our wicked ways and seek your face like never before. Father, would you speak to us this morning from your holy word? And Father, would you transform us, each of us, God, in some way? Would you guard every word that I speak and Father, would you be in all that is heard? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you have heard about the storms. It's easy for people to confuse the two different storms. A lot of folks think the storm I talked about last week and this storm are the same, but they are not. And I want you to notice several things from this storm that I believe will help us understand the nature of spiritual storms, those storms that are purpose-driven by God, that are designed uh, to equip us and to develop us and to draw us closer to God. The first thing I want you to notice is that we see Jesus' exhortation to the storm. We see it in verse 45. This is an interesting statement because uh, we don't see it in the other storm because he's in the boat. But here it says, look at verse 45 immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. Look at this. Underline this, if you will. He made his disciples get into the boat. He made them get into the boat. This is his exhortation. You get in the boat. You go on. I'll, I'll be there, but you go on ahead. He, the first thing that we notice now is that Jesus commanded them. He, he told them, I want you to get in the boat uh, and go on beyond. This storm, by the way, was not optional. Remember, some storms are. 
And by the way, if you can get out of a storm, you ought to get out of a storm. Some storms are optional. They are because we live in a broken world, and, and, and they're, they're optional. But some we don't, have, uh, we don't have a choice about. They are, for God's people, remember, they are sent by God, and they have a very deliberate purpose. And when it is a storm that it is designed for our spiritual development, it is not optional. In other words, your spiritual development will sometimes necessitate storms in life. It may be that Jesus needs to teach you how to walk with him in the midst of life's turmoil. That may be what he's wanting to do in a storm. If you're going through a spiritual storm right now, it, God is certainly trying to draw you closer to him. It may be that he's trying to teach you that you can trust him under any circumstance. Have you learned the lesson of the storm to trust Christ beyond your understanding and in any circumstance? It may be that he's trying to cultivate some new fruit in your life. He may be trying to soften you up. He may be trying to, to, to develop compassion in you, or he may be trying to develop a joy or let you know what peace is like in the midst of a storm. He may be in the process of cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in your life, like self-control. The disciples had no idea of this coming. Just like last week, it was unexpected. This storm is unexpected as well. Jesus didn't tell them in advance, nor did he hint that there's a storm coming. Jesus doesn't always tell us there's a storm approaching. We've had a lot of bad weather in the last two weeks in this area. And uh, the weather forecasters, uh, we follow them, you know, and they can tell us, anticipate this and this, and this is what's coming, and winds are coming, tornadoes are, are coming. They can tell us to be prepared and anticipate. There are some storms that you can anticipate, but there are others that Jesus sends you into. And he doesn't tell you it's coming. Now, he knows it's coming. But he doesn't tell you because he, doesn't, he knows this. If it, it, This is a storm that's necessary for your life and your development. And if he told you, you'd find a way to try to get away. They had no idea it was coming. Friend, I want to tell you something. Storms are coming. The, by the way, the storm, let's, you know, let's expand a little bit. The storm that we're facing globally right now is, is a storm that will pass at some point in time. We don't know what the effects of that will be, but there will be other storms. There'll be more storms that come. And the disciples had no idea that it came. But when it comes, it's important how we respond. I believe the storm that's going on globally right now is important for the church of God more than ever before to respond properly, to understand, and to grow spiritually. And I'll tell you, Jesus knew what he was doing when he sent them into the storm. Um, he made them, and he knew what he was doing. Jesus is in control, listen, of the spiritual storms that he sends us into. He does it on purpose because he's refining us and he's redesigning us. He does, he sends us into the storm because he is working on us. Here's the second thing I want you to notice though. Not only Jesus' exhortation, but I want you to see Jesus' observation of the storm. Look at verse 48. Keep your Bibles open. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. Underline the phrase, uh, uh, he saw. Or some translations say, seeing them. Uh, Jesus' observation of the storm. Jesus saw them from a distance. Uh, he knew exactly what was going on because he sent them into the storm, and, and their storm was not out of his view or out of his control. I'll tell you this, when you are in the middle of a spiritual storm, it is easy to wonder if God is even aware of what you are facing. They were, it says, they were painfully making headway. They were straining against the wind in the midst of the storm. You see, our ability to see clearly the reason for the storms is very limited, and because our 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 ability to understand or see the storm uh, for what it is all about, can, it can cause us to misunderstand the storm. It can cause us to make assumptions and accusations about the storm and about God and even about ourselves. For example, we'll, we'll sometimes in the midst of the storm say, God must not care. If I'm in this storm, God must not care. You see, our, our perspective can, can be clouded and we don't understand and we make assumptions it may be we, we say something like this, I've, I must have done something wrong. Uh, this is a discipline. Now, there are storms of discipline. Don't get me wrong. There are storms, of, but in a spiritual storm, it's not about discipline. In a spiritual storm, it's about depth. 
And we can, if we're not careful, we can say, well, I must have done something wrong. Now, if you've done something wrong, it could be a storm of discipline, and you need to repent and deal with God on that. It could be that we start making statements like that. Well, God is just unfair. God is, listen, friend, God is never unfair. He has never been unfair. If God were, you don't want God's fairness. If God were fair, all of us would go to hell. Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. Dear friend, you don't want fairness from God. You want mercy from God. And, uh, and, and, but if we're not careful, we're in the storm, we'll start saying, well, God is not fair. Never pray for the fairness of God. <clears throat> but for the mercy and the grace of God. Or, or we may say something like this. We may, in the midst of the storm, begin to experience self-pity. And that's an easy emotion uh, for us to experience. And we start saying something, God, why me? God, why me? Billy Graham, years ago when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he was undergoing an interview about that. And someone asked him the question, said, Dr. Graham, don't you think it a bit uh, strange that God would allow you to have Parkinson's? You've done so much for, for God. And this person was trying to kind of uh, 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 test him a little bit about that, uh, somewhat of a skeptic, and said, don't you think it's a little unfair? And don't you think, why, why you of all people? Uh, and Graham just simply responded to this. He said, why not me? He said, why not me? You see, it's an opportunity for me to show those who were without Christ how a believer has resources to deal with the storms of life. And if we're not careful, our perspective will be, why me, God? Why, why me? Why not us? We live in a fallen, broken world, and God is teaching us and trying to instruct us and draw us closer to Him. Perspective makes a difference. Storms have a way of skewing the way we see things. They can make us walk by sight and not by faith. Very soon, I'm going to begin a series, and that series is going to be entitled The Faith Chronicles. And we're going to talk about great men and women and the ordeals that they went through, but their faith and their victory that they experienced. You see, God has called us to walk by faith, not by sight. And that's what was happening in this uh, storm. And that's what happened in the storm we talked about uh, last week as God was trying to uh, help his followers learn to trust him and walk by faith. Our perspective is so flawed. Uh, and, and it causes us to jump to conclusions or make faulty assumptions about our storms. Uh, never trust your sight with spiritual things. Spiritual things are faith-related things. And if you trust your sight, more often than not, you'll make faulty assumptions about what God is up to. But now Jesus never has that problem. Jesus' perspective is never flawed. Ours is. His isn't. Jesus never exaggerates. And Jesus' perspective is not based on assumptions. You see, Jesus has your storm in complete perspective and because that's true, you can believe that he is using your storm for good. In a storm, we can only see what's in front of us. What's happening at that moment will keep us from seeing a bigger picture or a bigger purpose. But listen, friend, the fact is Jesus is aware of your storm, and he has a complete picture of your storm. Jesus saw, think about that, from a distance. They were out in the lake a long way off. Jesus has been up on the mountainside. He has been seeking the Father, and he looks out, and he can see the distance is not a problem. And he saw their storm. I want to tell you something. Jesus sees the, uh, your storm, his observation of your storm. Don't ever think that Jesus doesn't see, that Jesus doesn't know. Jesus has a bigger picture, and Jesus has a bigger purpose in your life. But the fact remains that Jesus is the only one that has the complete picture of your storm, and that's why you have to trust him. You only really have two options in the storm. Number one is you can rebel in the storm. Jesus must not love me. Jesus is punishing me. On and on it goes. And you can rebel and say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to follow him anymore. You have that option. And by the way, he won't stop you. He won't keep you from rebelling against him. He won't keep you from saying, the way I see it is this way. And one of the big problems today in, in our, our world is that people have elevated their own opinions about what God is up to above God's word about what he is up to. 
And friend, you can just say, I don't accept what God is doing. I don't want to walk by faith. I choose to rebel against my creator. You can do that, and he will not stop you. Or you have the other option, you can trust him in the storm. I mean, you can trust him. You say, look, it's a storm. I don't understand it. I don't know what to do about it. All I can do is trust Jesus in the storm until the storm passes by or until Jesus walks by. That's your options. Trust him in the storm. And by the way, when you trust him in the storm, guess what happens? You grow. You grow because it's a storm designed to draw you closer to him. But let me give you a third thing about this storm, and that is we see Jesus' revelation in the storm. I love this, verse 48. It says, not only did, uh, uh, did he see them, but they saw him. It says, in, at the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass them by. Here's the revelation. They, they finally saw Jesus in the storm. Where was Jesus? Well, he'd been watching them, remember? And waiting for just, listen, don't miss this, waiting for just the right moment to intersect their storm and to reveal his presence and that he was there to help. It was somewhere, we're told, between 3 and 6 a.m. The disciples think had been battling this storm all night. I bet that was a long night. Have you been in a storm? Are you in a storm? And you think, man, this thing is never going to end. I feel like I've used all my energy up battling the storm, battling the storm. But Jesus is watching. And just like here, at the right moment, Jesus would intersect their lives. He would intersect their, their path. He would intersect their storm. But he was watching. And it says, interesting statement, he intended to pass by them, literally pass before them. Or where they could see him and see that it was okay. Here's why you say, well, that's kind of odd that Jesus would just pass by them and, and he would just go on. What is that all about? I will, I will, let me just say it this way. Jesus wanted them to see him and relax and follow him. He meant to just w- reveal himself to them and then they follow him to the shore. He intended to pass before them. And... Um, And them know, well, Jesus is here. Think about this. Jesus is in, he's walking on the storm waters. And he wanted them to just see him there and say, oh, there's Jesus. We're okay. But their unbelief, listen, their unbelief prevented them from comprehending who it was. Now, they've just come out of a miracle. I'll talk about that later. They just experienced a miracle, but now he's on the water walking in front of them, and they don't comprehend who he is. Their unbelief had blinded them. And by the way, in a storm, if you don't believe, if you don't trust, you'll miss seeing Jesus. Some years ago, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book entitled, he is there and he is not silent. It's an excellent book. And it was a response to philosophers who had tried to suggest that, that God did not exist and that he was removed from any involvement with humanity. And Francis Schaeffer challenges the pessimism of these philosophers and he reveals in this book the infinite, very personal God who is there, who cares, and who is involved. And this is what he says, because God is there, because God does care, and because God is involved, he said, that changes everything. He said, it changes the whole world. You see, you may be in a spiritual developmental storm right now, and you may be wondering that very thing, where is Jesus? Friend, I want to tell you uh, today, he is watching, and he is waiting for the right moment, and at the right moment, when he's finished with your lesson on spiritual development, he will reveal his presence in your storm. He's there, and he's not silent, but I'll tell you what he is, he's patient. He waits. He watches, and he's looking. Have you learned the lesson of the storm? And by the way, if you don't learn the lesson of the storm, there'll be more lessons of that sort in your life to help you learn the storm. He's patient. But then there's a fourth thing I want you to see today, and that is I want you to see Jesus' proclamation during the storm. Look at verse 50 in your Bible, if you will. It says, for they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them Look at this, and said, take heart, for it is I. Do not be afraid. 
This is his proclamation in the storm. You know, if they thought he was a ghost, they didn't recognize him for who he was because of their unbelief. Again, they'd forgotten the loaves and the fish. They'd forgotten the miracle of the 5,000. And whatever this was on the waves, it was an apparition. It may look like Jesus uh, or may not to them, but the fact is their unbelief kept them from seeing who he was, and it created incredible fear in their lives. But look what Jesus did. He brings this proclamation to them. He spoke with them, the Bible says, and he said to them. He brought words of hope and words of help to them in the storm. And listen to me, friend, at just the right time, keep your ear tuned because Jesus has something to say to you in your storm. So stay in his word, by the way. If you want to hear from him, stay in his word and and stay in his will. Walk in his will even if the storm isn't breaking up right now. Don't lose heart and don't lose focus. Think about what Jesus said to them. He said, take uh, uh, courage be of good cheer, some translations say. In other words, get happy in the storm. That's an odd bit of counsel, isn't it? In the storm, get happy. He he says, take courage, be of good cheer, get happy, relax. You're going to make it. Hang on and hang in. Why? Because he said, be of good cheer. Take courage. Why? Because of the second thing he says, it is I. It is I. He said, because I'm here. Enough said. Jesus said, it's me. Uh, Take courage. Get happy. Calm down. Be of good cheer because you belong to me and I belong to you. And I'm here now in the midst of your storm. Relax. You might say today, chill out. I'm with you. Put your eyes on Jesus in the storm. Get your eyes on him when the winds are blowing and the waves are rising and Jesus is there. You know he sees and he reveals himself and he proclaims a message to you in your storm. That's what he said to them. He said what they needed to know. But remember, after they had been going through the storm for a long time, You know, sometimes our problem is we want Jesus, okay, I want to trust Jesus, but I need him to speak to me right now. And Jesus is trying to produce endurance and faith. And he's trying to say, will you trust me if the storm rages even more so? Hours upon hours they battled, waiting for a word from God, a word from God, a word from God, a word, the appearance, and finally Jesus uh, uh, shows up. And then after he showed up, he spoke up. And listen, in your storm right now, one of the greatest things that you can have is to pursue God and wait on God, and God will intersect at just the right time. Don't give up. Don't lose heart at the right time, and he will speak to you. Stay in this book so he can speak to your heart and give you a promise, give you something that will allow you to make it through the storm. He says, it is me. I'm there. I'm here the point of your need, and he knows when to make the right declaration and the right proclamation to your heart. So hold on. Don't give up. And then he said this to them, don't be afraid. Their eyes told them, be afraid. Think about it. Be afraid of the storm. And initially, be afraid of whoever this is coming to you. You know, there are some folks that are afraid to trust Jesus. Uh, They seem uh, vaguely because they haven't pursued him, they haven't surrendered to him, and they get to have a glimpse of him, and, and they're f- afraid of Jesus. And Jesus is saying to us, don't be afraid of the storm, put your trust in me. And then he says, don't be afraid of me, trust in me. It is I, don't be afraid. Don't, don't look at the wind and don't look at the waves, the, the, the storm that's going on. The master of the storm is on your side. Wow. He's with you. Huh. And better yet, we need to be with him. The only survivor of a storm-wrecked ship was a little boy. And he was swept along by the waves onto a rock. And he sat on that rock all night long. The morning came and and he was seen by a rescue vessel. 
And when they rescued this young boy, they brought him onto the ship, and one of his rescuers asked him the question, son, did you tremble uh, while you were on the rock during the night? Did you tremble when you were in the waves were crashing around that rock? And did you tremble during the night? And the little boy answered and said, oh, yes, I trembled all night long. But the rock didn't tremble. Dear friend, I tell you today, the storms sometimes make us tremble. But the rock on which we stand never shakes. It never trembles. Don't be afraid. Take his word into your storm and anchor your life on the rock that never moves, that never shakes, that never trembles. That's what Jesus wants you to do in the storm. But here's the fifth thing I want you to see today. I want you to see Jesus' demonstration over the storm. Look at verse 51. It says, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. Now, yes, there are storms, spiritual storms that Jesus creates, storms for your life. But listen, whatever the storm is, he still has control over it. And the storm's timing operates on God's clock. That's why you've got to trust God, because he is the clock keeper. He is the storm watcher. And the storms will often intensify based upon your need to grow. And then when he's ready for the storm to end, it will end, but not a moment before and not a moment too late. And when the storm, when he gets in your boat with you, the the winds cease. The storm is never a power problem for Jesus. Think about that. This storm, their battle with the wind and the waves wasn't because Jesus couldn't. Listen, back on shore where he was, Jesus could very well have said, Lord, okay, they fought long enough. Stop the storm. But he didn't. He came to them in the storm. We always want to get out of the storm. I do. I'd rather not have any storms, and in particular storms that are tailor-made for me. I don't want storms. I want out of the storm. But you know what Jesus again and again teaches us, and the Scripture teaches us, is that God tends to go through the storm with us. And that's what Jesus did. He saw them from a distance. He saw the storm, and then he came to them in the storm. By the way, Jesus didn't have to settle the storm down in order to walk on the waves. He didn't have to say, well, I have to calm this storm down if I'm going to get to them, if I'm going to bring them hope, and if I'm going to bring them help. Jesus uh, controls the storms. He's the master of storms. Storms obey him. And so he didn't have to say, we need to calm this storm down, uh, Father, so I can walk to the disciples. In fact, the amazing thing would be to see him coming to them on the waves with the wind, wouldn't it? I just remind you that the storm, Jesus doesn't have to calm the storm down to come to you. Jesus doesn't have to calm the the waves and the wind that's circulating in your life to get in the boat with you. He is the master of the storm. The storm is never a power problem for Jesus. It's never about Jesus saying, well, I don't have enough power for this one. This one's bigger than I've ever seen. I don't have enough power. It's never a power problem. He created all things. The storms are no problem for him. I'll tell you what the storm is for Jesus. It's a principal process for us. He has initiated the spiritual storms for us uh, uh, that, that will help us trust him more and go deeper with him. And that leads me to the final thing I want you to see from our story today, and that is in verse 52. It says, for they had not gained any insight. Jesus' education with the storm. Now, stay with me because I want to wrap up with this, but I want you to get this. This goes back to the very first thing that we were talking about, and that is context. We were talking about the fact that he had just fed the multitude, and then he tells the disciples immediately, the Scripture says, to get in the boat and go on ahead. Why? Because this is all about their education. And it says in verse 52, look at verse 52, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Why? Because they had not understood that Jesus not only has power over the practical things like food, he has power over the universal things. And they had missed that. 
Uh, they thought it's one thing to, to feed everybody, but they had missed it. What Jesus was trying to say, you remember, did you see what I did there? If I can do that, if I can multiply the fish and the loaves and feed thousands upon thousands, why would you not trust me for every detail of your life? And so he sent them into a storm, a storm that he created just for them so he could teach them and educate them that he was trustworthy no matter what the circumstances of their life, if they have food or if they don't have food, if they're in a storm or if they're not in a storm. He says, have you learned how to trust me? Spiritual storms are training storms. They're God's way of bringing truth to us and building trust in us. Did you get that? He brings us truth, and that truth he spoke to them. Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. It's I. You see, the, the spiritual storms are storms that bring truth in order to build trust. Have you learned to cling to the truth of God and trust him because of that truth? That's what Jesus wants to do in the storms that come our way. And so spiritual storms are to train us. Unfortunately, the disciples had already forgotten how quickly they had forgotten. You and I, we read this and say, how could, I mean, they're with him all the time. How could they possibly forget all the mighty things that he had done. And yet, within, within just hours, they were in a boat having left uh, uh, an all-time kind of miracle, and they'd already forgotten about it. It says they had forgotten. They, they didn't understand about the loaves and the fish. They didn't, the reason that Jesus sent them on after the miracle is he was trying to say, are you going to continue now, based on the miracle you've seen, to trust me in the other matters of your life? But they didn't understand that every, everything was an opportunity for their trust to grow in Christ. They had forgotten it. They would experienced the miracle of the feeding, but they had forgotten within just a few hours. I want to ask you something. Are you in a storm today and you've forgotten who God is? You've forgotten the miracle of the loaves and the fishes? You, you've forgotten what he's brought you through in the past? You've forgotten what he has taught you. You've forgotten the promise that you hold to that he has given you. Have you already forgotten that? Dear friend, the disciples had forgotten. And the results were threefold. Because they had forgotten they were fighting a storm without faith. I want to tell you, I don't believe you can fight the storms of life without faith. I don't think you can fight them successfully. I guess you can fight them and try to wheel yourself through them, but you can't fight them effectively and successfully without faith. And they were fighting a storm without faith. They had already forgotten about the loaves and the fish. They hadn't understood. They were fatigued from fighting all night. I'll tell you this, you fight by yourself and it will wear you out. Because God doesn't want you fighting the fights God doesn't want you uh, fighting the storms in your own strength. That's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary. Are you weary today? Come to me, all you who are weary and you're burdened down, you're, you're heavy laden. Come to me, he said, and I take my burden upon you, he said, for my burden is light. I'll exchange a light burden for the heavy burden that you're trying to carry. He says, come to me, and then he says, I'll give rest to your soul. Maybe you're, you're watching today and you say, I need rest for my soul. That rest can only be found in Jesus Christ. And, and notice he says, come to me. Now he says, I'm waiting for you. Jesus is a gentleman. He will not force his way or his will or himself upon you. But he says, I just want you to know if you'll come to me, I'm, I'm ready, I'm willing. You can exchange your burden for my burden. My burden is light you, because I'm carrying it. Or you can try to fight the fight of storms in your own strength, but it'll wear you out. They were fatigued because of their own efforts to fight through the storm. And then, of course, they were frightened. They were frightened because in just a short while, they had forgotten what Jesus looked like. And instead of saying, look, it's Jesus, they said, look, it's a ghost. 
It's a ghost. Friend, I want to tell you something. When you fight through storms without faith, you'll have a hard time recognizing Jesus. And he may be all around you. There's people watching this today, and Jesus is all around you as you go through your storm, and you have not recognized him because you're trying to fight this fight on your own. You're trying to get through in your own strength. You're exhausted. The burden is weighing you down, and Jesus is there standing, saying to you, come to me in the storm. I don't know if you're, oh, we're all going through storm in, on some level. We, we would all admit that. But I don't know what kind of storm you're in right now. But if you're going through a hard time, maybe these words from a song sung by Christian Wurtzen will help you. They helped me some years ago. The song is called The Fire. Let me just share these words with you. It says, I've been through a fire that had deepened my desire to know the living God more and more. It hasn't been much fun, but the work that it has done uh, in my life has been worth the hurt. You see, sometimes we need the hard times to bring us to our knees. Otherwise, we do as we please and never heed him. For he always knows what's best, and it's when we are distressed that we really come to know God as he really is. I wonder, are you facing a spiritual storm of development, of depth? God is trying to teach you. God is trying to train you. Are you fighting? Are you fighting? Are you fatigued? Are you frightened because you're trying to get through it in your own strength? Are you, are you fighting? Uh, are you fatigued? Or, uh, are, are you frightened because you've forgotten who he is? or because you think he's not aware of your storm, or because you believe that he's not there. Listen, he is there, and he cares. And so you are safe, and you can trust him. Some years ago, I read a story about uh, that was repeated from an Episcopalian bishop from Colorado. And the story went something like this. Uh, The bishop said when he was in undergraduate school at the University of Colorado, he he said he spent a couple hours a week reading to one of his fellow students. That student's name was John, and he was blind. And he said, one day I asked him how he'd lost his sight, and he told me of an accident that had happened when he was a teenager, and he had become blind, and then how at that point uh, he gave up on life. In fact, he said, when the accident happened and I knew that I would never see again, I felt that my life had ended, at least as far as I was concerned, and I became bitter and angry with God for letting it happen, and I took my anger out on everyone that was around me. He said, I felt that since I had no future, I wouldn't lift a finger on my own behalf. In fact, I would just simply sit around or lay around and let others wait on me. I shut my bedroom door and refused to come out except for meals. He says, the man that I knew, however, wasn't like that now. He was an eager learner and an earnest student. And so he said, I had to ask, what changed your attitude? What changed you? And he told me this story. He said, well, here's how it changed. One day in my exasperation, my father came into my room and he started giving me a lecture. He said he was tired of my feeling sorry for myself. He said that winter was coming and it was my job to put up the storm windows. And then he said, you get those windows up by supper time tonight or else. And he shouted and slammed the door on his way out. Well, this blind young man named John said, that made me so angry that I resolved to do it. Muttering, he said, and cursing to myself, I groped my way out to the garage. I found the windows. uh, I found a stepladder and all the necessary tools, and I groped my way back to begin the work. And then I thought, they'll be sorry when I fall off the ladder and break my neck. But little by little, he said, groping my way around the house, I finally got the job done. And then he stopped. And his blind eyes misted up, this bishop said, and he told me, you see, I later discovered that at no time during the day when I was working on putting those windows 
up. At no time during the day had my father ever been more than four or five feet from my side. Friend, I want to tell you something. The spiritual storms are there to train us. They're there to teach us. They're to make us into what God longs for us to be. And so I remind you today to remember that even in the storms, he's present. He's only an arm's length away as you walk through the valleys, as you face the waves and the winds. Your Father is there. Your Savior is there. And He wants you to know how much He cares. Do you trust Him? Dear friend, you say, well, all of that's great, but I don't know that I know Him as my Savior. Well, I want to help you today come to know Him as your Savior. And right where you are, you can invite Him to come into your life to be your Savior Remember he said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, burdened down. He wants to be and not just um, a Bible uh, uh, character. He wants to be your personal Savior, and you can receive him. Would you do that today right where you are, no matter uh, uh, who's around you? Would you pray a prayer from your heart that goes something like this to him? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I know I'm a sinner, and I know without you there's no hope for my life. And, Lord, I'm in storms. And, and Father, I want to go through those storms knowing that you are my Savior and you are with me every step of the way. And so right now, I invite you to come into my life and be my Master and be my Savior and be my Lord. Thank you for coming in, Lord Jesus. Now, if you prayed a prayer like that, he's promised to come in. I mean, he's prom- that's his promise to you. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become a child, uh, children of God. And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you prayed that, you called out to him, he heard that today. And you know, we'd love to help you with that decision. We'd love to get you some information to help you begin this transformation process, this growth process. It's free. There are no strings attached. All you've got to do is let us know about your decision, that you prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. I called upon Jesus, just like his uh, uh, word tells me. I called upon him today to become my Savior. What, uh, let us know about your decision. You'll see contact information on the screen uh, in front of you today. You can uh, simply text us. Take your cell phone, your tablet, your computer. Text us uh, the word uh, um, pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, to 334 384 8080 If you'll text that word pastor, we'll know what that means and we'd like to help you begin your new journey. You may be here uh, listening today and say, you know what, I've done that, but I need to be a part of a family. I don't have a church family to belong to. You know, the day's coming. We're going to gather back in this place. We think real soon that we'll gather And we'd love for you to be a part of this family. As people have been doing for the last month, we've been hearing from people saying, I want to be a part of the Ridgecrest family. You say, how do I do that? Well, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, and uh, uh, you say, I I, I know him, I want to be a part of the family of God, you do something for us. You text the word decision, the word decision, to that same number, 334-384-8080. And we'll know what that means. Just text that word, decision, 334 uh, 384-8080. Or in, in either of those cases, you can email us. Email us at decision at rbcdothan.org. Just the word decision at rbcdothan. That's the address. Email us and tell us, today I trusted Christ. Or today I'd like to join Ridgecrest. That's all you need to do. We'll know exactly uh, what that means And uh, we'll follow up and get you some information about how to do all of those things. Many have already done it this month, and we invite you to become a part of this family. I'm so glad that you've tuned in today, and I hope that the Lord has ministered His grace to your heart. Trust Him. Stay faithful and strong in the storms, whatever kind of storm it may be, whether a storm Uh, of God's uh, warning to us, a storm of spiritual development or death, a storm of discipline. Learn the lessons of the storm and go forward from this point. Thank you again. God bless you. Stay connected with us 
as you will in the days ahead, uh, hear uh, about the next steps and the next phases as we hopefully prepare to open uh, in the next few weeks. God bless you, and may the Lord richly uh, bless you in the days ahead.